The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So today, uh, we're, going to, we're going to be talking about uh, today and on Thursday, we're going to be trying to answer this question. We actually give a slightly different answer today than on Thursday, just to give you a, a roadmap of where we are going. Today is more going to be about the poverty trap in the sense that Paxolin described it to us in the uh, I think it was the, our second lecture, our first lecture together. We started from Paxolin's description of a poverty trap, which was really based on the immediate impact of the calories on your productivity that very day. And then that's what we are going to look at today, which is try to answer Dakari's question, which I've been put off, put off, putting off until now, which is to say, well, can we really believe his story? And then. On Thursday, we are going to further our inquiry into, into nutrition-based poverty trap by looking at things a little bit more subtle than, cal than the impact of calories on your productivity the very next day, but I by looking at things like micronutrients and by looking at things like feeding your children or feeding pregnant <coughs> mother uh, when they grow up, uh, so that the kids that they bear grow up as different people, etc. So. Uh, that's kind of the roadmap for, uh, for, the, uh, for our, our work on uh, today and, and on Thursday. So at the end of uh, <coughs> last lecture, we discussed the important uh, observation by Amartya Sen that maybe there are no famines in today's democracies, that the large, big famines are gone. Uh, or at least that when we observe them, they are due to some really extraordinary circumstances like uh, a war or a civil war. So there is a paper that I didn't ask you to read because it's a little long, uh, but the title is, Is Famine History? And it sort of uh, concludes that it might be outside of specific circumstances. I should say that it's history that might come back uh, as, uh, because we have no idea what, is glo but what global warming is going to do to the productivity of agriculture. And it may or may not be sufficiently bad that it might come back. But in the short run, uh, we may be in a situation where people are not starving to death in very large numbers like they did in West Mongol outside of, of some big serious political crisis. However, uh, malnutrition, or uh, undernutrition is not. You can see the food, uh, food and Agriculture Organization that's based in Rome uh, is in charge of trying to monitor people's situation. They try to estimate how many people are, are, are they called hungry. So that's, they, they give periodically uh, a number of the number of hungry people in the world and uh, not long ago, they came up with one billion. Uh, and that number, if you've seen, has been all over the newspaper, one billion hungry people in the world. To be completely honest, I have not fully understood how they compute the number of hungry people in the world. Because I suppose you could ask them, but I don't think this is what they're doing. I think they are trying to estimate a calorie requirement that people might need to fit. And the question is, do we really know what's a calorie requirement? And the answer to that is no. We don't really exactly know what's a calorie requirement. So maybe this notion of what's a hungry person is a little bit more hazy than I'd like it to be. But there are certainly a lot of people who look very skinny. Uh, so do you know what the body mass index is? The body mass index is your, um, sorry, go ahead. 730. 730? I didn't know about that 730. I think it's your, uh, it's your uh, uh, weight divided by your height square uh, in meters. Oh, that's maybe the 730 coming from. 
uh, it's, the, it's your weight in kilograms divided by your uh, height uh, in meter square. Uh, so sometimes I'm trying to think that this means that we are trying to el elongate the person over a little, over a square meter and seeing how, th how, fat, they, how fat that uh, rectangle would be. Uh, so that's the BMI. Uh, do you know what the, what the threshold for the BMI is? 18.5, so 18.5 is undernourished. And there is a, a large number of people, it comes in the slide a little uh, below, who are undernourished by, by the standard. Uh, people are also, there is about 2 billion people in the world who are anemic. <coughs> that means they don't have enough hemoglobin in their blood. Uh, not all of anemia is due to poor nutrition, but it's estimated that maybe half of this is due to, under, to iron deficiency anemia. So it's a deficiency in one particular micro, micronutrient, which is iron. So that's about one billion people who are anemic due to some deficiency in iron in their diet. Um, is there deficiency in iron or difficulty in absorbing the iron? A lot of these anemic people is in India. And sad, sadly, Indians combine the fact that many of them are vegetarian and that uh, their, their uh, diet is, is rich in, uh, in rice which is rich in phytates, which is an inhibitant for the absorption of iron, which is one reason why uh, the, the, the rate of anemia is particularly high in India, is that on the one hand, they get less iron in their diet than other people at comparable level of calorie intake, just because those come less from meat. And on the other hand, they, they are less good at absorbing them due to, to the rice. Uh, there was a large increase in food prices in 2016. And then again, they collapsed during the, the crisis, and they increased again in 2010 to be almost at 2008 level. Uh, and there are two consequences of an increase in food prices on those of the poor who are net consumer of, uh, of food. That is, those who produce uh, less th than they consume. Those are, for example, the urban poor. And those are, on the one hand, uh, a large proportion of the budget of the poor, a larger proportion of the budget of the poor is spent on food. So an increase in the price of food affects uh, the poorest uh, more than proportionally compared to any other source of inflation. So if the inflation, if the source of inflation is sort of a general increase in prices or it's driving, driven by the price of housing, then that affects everybody the same or that might affect the rich more. But if the inflation is as, to, as it is today, driven by an increase in the price of food, then it affects more the people who are relying the most, of course, on food. And then, so that's the first story. That's one reason why uh, organizations like the World Bank, the UN, the FAO, are particularly worried about an increase in food prices because that's disproportionately affecting the poor. And it's also disproportionately affecting the urban poor, which may be one of the many reasons that have led to the unrest that you observe today in the Middle East. Uh, the reason why I'm mentioning that is that in 2008, at the, height of the, um, at the height of the previous increase in food prices, there were food riots in Egypt that never had uh, you know, achieved the kind of intensity of what we saw a few in the last few weeks, but were clearly and very directly prompted by the price of food. And here, we, we, the whole rhetoric of the, of the revolt is, was framed along political reform. But it is not implausible that part of the reason why so many people, in particular in urban centers, were willing to spend uh, so much time in, outside uh, protesting is because they were profoundly unhappy with the, with the increase in the price of food. And the second reason uh, why we might be about an increase in the price of food is if we take a uh, Paxolin story seriously and we are wondering that this increase in hunger is going to lead to some vicious circle. So if you read the World Bank documents about, you know, the World Bank's job in a sense is to raise money for developing countries. So part of the World Bank's communication department job is to be slightly alarmist. So we need to take everything they say with a pinch of salt. But one of the things that they would very frequently say is the price of food increase, that makes the poor poorer, that makes them more difficult for them to get enough calories, which means they can't work as hard, which means they will be plunged back into, uh, into poverty. 
And so that's what I want to, this is the story that Pat Paxolin told us uh, uh, in, the, in our first lecture, and that's, the, that's what I want to investigate with you today. Uh, whether we have reasons to be worried about this, this kind of immediate vicious, uh, vicious circle. So I want to give us a quick refresher of what, what Paxolin's story. Uh, so with your wage, your daily wage, it's a, it's a short run nutrition, a nutrition based poverty trap. With your wage, you buy food that gives you strength, that allows you to get some more wages uh, at the end. So, so you buy more food and that gives you strength and you have more wages, etc. And that's how you survive, maybe on a daily basis. So that means that it creates a relationship between how much you start from, you know, one fine evening and, uh, and what is your income tomorrow. And that also means that it creates a relationship with the wage level and your ability to do any work at all. So Paxolin's story was that the wage had dropped because of the increase in uh, input prices and the uncertainty that the farmer had about whether they were going to be able to raise their output prices correspondingly. That had led to a decrease in the, in the wage at the same time as the, there was an increase in the food prices, so a big decrease in the real wage in terms of the, the food entitlement of a day of work, as Amartyasen would say, which means that if you took this food entitlement and you had nothing else to supplement it with, this just was not enough to give you the strength to do the work to earn that wage. So that means that someone like Paxolin, who had no extra resources, was not able to work at all. So that creates an inequality among people because someone, take, take Paxolin and imagine that in fact he, he also had a little piece of land. Then what could he have done with this, piece, with this little piece of land once the wages had gone down? Ben? Sell some of it. So he could have sell, sold some of it to get money or he could have rented some of it and get money. And so now he could supplement, so suppose he rents some of it and gets money. So he starts the morning with 1,000 rupees from the rent of his field. And that can be complemented with whatever wage he earned last, last, uh, yesterday for his work. And that might be enough to, allow, to give him the strength to do a, a day of work. So if you compare Paxolin to his brother, for example, he has a brother in the story, right? If you compare Paxolin with his brother who had a piece of land, they might be exactly similar in terms of their underlying body and their strengths, etc. But the fact that one of them has a piece of land allows them to, uh, to work and therefore they start with a little bit more non-labor income, which gives them much more labor income. So the existing inequality in non-labor income is strengthened by, equality, by the inequality in labor income which is very different from what we would see in our standard models, where the richer people would be less likely to work because they already have the non-labor income money. So the labor market would serve to uh, make people more similar rather than less similar. So that's the story he told us. And as we saw last time, the necessary condition for such a poverty trap is that the capacity curve, which relates your income today to your income tomorrow via the biology of the body, has this S-shaped curve that we discussed. That is, it starts below the 45 degree line, then at some point crosses it and then comes back. So we are not going to go back to that because we saw it in, uh, in detail last time, but I can, you know, oops, that was supposed to be the shape again. It doesn't want to come back. So the, sh the S-shape is made of two relations. The S-shape is a relationship between income today and income tomorrow. Let me draw it since I can't have it on the slide. So this is income today and income tomorrow. And so the S shape is actually not one function, it's the product of two functions. One is given how much income you have, how much calories do you decide to eat? And then the, the calorie that you eat, how much productive do they make you? So if we write it in math, it is, it's like there is income, nutrition, 
is equal to g, function g of income today. Because you get your wages and then you eat some good meal. And then income tomorrow is a function f of nutrition. That means that income tomorrow is f of g of income today. So this is what makes this S shape. Now, uh, so what we can do today is to look separately at these two relationships. What's the strength of the relationship between income tomorrow and, nut and nutrition today? And what's the relationship between nutrition today and income today? And here, when I mean today and tomorrow, I really mean today and tomorrow. This is a short-run phenomenon that we are talking about. Or maybe next week, but not a matter of generations or years. So suppose that there is indeed that this particular relationship, income tomorrow and nutrition, is indeed a shape. And suppose that you were a very poor person, so you, you, had, you were in the low part of the S. And suppose that you happen onto a bit of money. What would you do with this money? If that relationship was indeed, if, the, if this relationship between income and nutrition was as shape, and you were a very poor person, but you find a, a pile of money on the ground, what would you do with the money? Well, if that holds true, then you would want to eat more. So that means that if there is indeed an S shape between income tomorrow and nutrition, then we should see a very strong relationship between nutrition and income for the very poor. Because it is like a for an excellent investment. If you find yourself here, there is no better investment you can do than eating some more. So a first thing you can do is we can see whether poor people are really trying to put uh, all, of their, all of the possible money into food. So the question is the possible money. So that means that we would find the share of food in the budget should be very high for the poor. And the second thing it would mean is that it would increase quite fast with income. And possibly it would again have a form of S-shape for the following reason. Suppose that you have some unavoidable ex expense to survive. For example, you need a house and you need some clothes. So unless you live like in a very hot country where you don't really need much clothes, you need a house, you need like a piece of land to put the house on, and you need some clothes. So someone who has a budget of 20 rupees will, say, will spend, say, 5 rupees on clothing and house. That's, they can't do anything with more than that. And 15 rupees on food. Okay, So that's the poorest person. And then if there is really this S shape here, this person would be somewhere here. So they would remain quite poor. And now, another person comparable in other respect, but has a total budget of 30 rupees, let's say because they have some non-labor income or because they have a bit more wage, then they would also spend, they would still spend unavoidable expenses on clothing and houses, but they would not do any more. They, they, they would still do just the minimum, and they would spend all the rest on food. That means that when I increase the by, by how much did I increase the income of this person? Sorry? Yeah, 10 out of 20 in percentage term, that's 50%. And this is how much? That's harder. 20, 25 out of 15. 25, 25, an increase from 15 to 25. It's 10 on the basis of 15. Six. I trust you, you are the MIT student. <laughs> so whatever it is, this is what's going to be on the video. 66? Let's go with 66. That means that when I increase your income by 50%, your expenditure on food increases by 66%. Uh, 66 so if I divide by one or the other, that's what concept is it called? When I, an elasticity. So this means the elasticity of uh, food expenditure with respect to overall expenditure is more than one for the extremely poor. Because you start by having, you know, taking care of your essential needs, and after that you're putting all of the money into food. 
because you're thinking this is highly valuable. So this is one thing. And the second thing is now you go from someone who gets uh, 30 rupees to someone who gets 45 rupees. So I've rigged this so that it's nicely another increase of 50%. And now this person who makes 45 rupees, I can spend a bit more on, they, they're already kind of over here somewhere. So the marginal value of one more rupees into food is not that high. So they are still going to spend a bit more on food, but only five rupees more. They're going to spend a bit more to have a nicer closing and some houses. And now they can bring in entertainment, right? Because now their basic needs are taken care of. The marginal value of extra in, is not that high. So they can you know, get into doing other things. So now the elasticity is going to be from 25 to 30. That's out of 25. Sorry? 20%, is that? Is it? Yes, 20%. 20% out of an increase in 50%. Now the elasticity is much less than one. So what we would see is a group of people, the poorest people, where we have very high elasticity. And then for anybody who is somewhat richer, the elasticity of food consumption with overall budget would be less than one, which is what people refer to as the angle curve, which is the share of food of the budget increases less than proportionally. So the angle curve refers to this, uh, this phenomenon, which is the share of food increases less than proportionally as you become richer. But it's worth pointing out that in an S-shaped world, we would probably have a reverse angle curve phenomenon where the elasticity, f the, the share of food of the budget first increases and then decreases. So the question is, do we see this? that they spend, the poor spend as much money as they can on food. And the second question is, do we see this? Which is, do we see anybody whose elasticity of food consumption with respect to budget is more than one? So that's kind of where I want to go next. So first, let's look at the food share uh, in the budget around the world. And this comes from uh, data sets that um, uh, uh, the, the, the World Bank collects a uh, data set in many countries called the Living Standard Measurement Surveys. And they very nicely put them on a website. Not all of their surveys, because in some cases they have uh, agreement with governments that doesn't allow them to do that, but a lot of their surveys are on the web. You can actually download them and play with them. You're welcome to do that. And uh, we did that. So we took, uh, we we took the overall expenditure to compute people's um, budget, transfer it into PPP dollars. So this is people who live under a dollar a day at purchasing power parity, so in US prices, and uh, look at the share of their budget. So this is what we find for a bunch of uh, people living in rural areas. And uh, this is food, alcohol, tobacco, education, and, and health. So what do you? What, what are your remarks when you see these numbers? Richard? I have a question yeah. about the education percentages. Uh, what do those mean is that whether they're paying for tuition or uh, educational supplies? So this is only education expenditure. So this is tuition if the child is in a private school or if they get extra tuition, which a lot of people in developing countries do. They get like extra help at home. Uh, this, could be, uh, this could be school uniform, school books, boarding school for kids who are in boarding school. Any education-related expenditure would be in there. Yeah, Ben. Just a couple of confusion about the meal in Mexico, for example, um, spend a great percentage of those money on tobacco and education. Yeah. Um, in addition, <coughs> alcohol, tobacco, cotton, for most countries, not all, is larger than that. <coughs> So Ben is making 2.1 Mexico is spending more on uh, alcohol and, and tobacco, Mexico, more on alcohol and tobacco than on education, uh, spends very, very little on health. Uh, that doesn't mean people are totally unhealthy, but actually Mexico has an excellent healthcare system, which is basically free for most people. Um, and in all of the countries, the, the share on alcohol and tobacco is, tends to be 
uh, you know, at least comparable to what we see for education and health. Yep. Why don't the numbers add up to 100%? Oh, because there are other things to do with your money other than food, alcohol, education, health. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, <laughs> <laughs> going to the movies, <laughs> uh, putting some clothes on your back, <laughs> that kind of stuff. <laughs> If it adds up to more, more than 100, we're in trouble, which is quite possible, but uh, I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> I don't guarantee it, but I hope that that kind of mistakes would, have, uh, uh, we, would not have withstood scrutiny. Any other observation on this, on this, on this table? So let me ask one question then. Do you think this is uh, the share of the budget on food is high or low? High. I think the share of, of food is high. Yes. Anybody has a, uh, wants to argue the opposite? Ben? I mean, if you're looking on less than a dollar a day, I don't think you have much room to spend your money on luxury goods. And so I think it's about right actually. Oh, it's about right. It's about, yeah, so the question is whether it's high or low. So one thing I should say is that it's kind of variable. You know, it goes from pretty low in India, 56%, to uh, pretty high in Timor, 77%. Remember, this is all people who are equally poor in terms of their uh, uh, ability to consume things because they're all below a dollar a day at PPP. And they make very different choices. So they are quite viable. Whether it's high or low, I think it's in the high of the beholder. On the one hand, it's certainly a high part of the budget compared to what people spend, for example, in the US. On the other hand, if you compare it with, for example, what is spent of, on tobacco or even on education, given that a lot of these countries have uh, a free education system, the, the education expenditure they are making are extras. You know, I'm sure, surely valuable extras. But that means that the, there seems to be actually some wiggle room that you could do something about your food budget and increase it without sacrificing anything else that's vital for the house. Yeah. I have a question about the food percentage. Do the people who tend to spend more food, is their nutrition any better, or is it that fair? So that's an excellent question. We're going to look into that, which is when you increase, when we spend more money on food, it could be uh, on more nutritious food or more calories, or it could be on uh, not so much more nutritious food, it could be on better tasting food. And the short answer is that uh, the two are happening, which is, I don't know whether it's true at the country level. For example, India is a country that spends very little on food and which has probably the worst nutritional status for this group of people than in the world. But at the individual level, we're going to see that very soon when people increase how much money they spend on food, they both get more food and they get better food, more expensive food uh, for, the, for the calories and the nutrition they are getting. So both things happen together. Um, what are the requirements for the surrogate and they spend it? Have like children that could receive an education? No, this is everyone. As long as it's everyone who lives on less than a dollar a day per capita. So if there are five of them, it's their entire budget divided by five. And if someone, if no one has any children, then they won't spend anything on education. They would they spend, this is means that they spend per child, they spend a fair amount on education. Right, so that's an excellent, uh, that's an excellent point. The point is, in answer to the unstated question, which is what explains this variation across countries? And a first possible explanation is the, the relative price of food is, is different. So food is relatively more exp so food could be relatively more expensive in Timor Leste, which is why people are uh, spending more money to get the same thing. What is interesting is that uh, the opposite seems to be true, which is um, India 
because India is uh, a very large economy that, has, that is able to produce very many things in India. Uh, the relative price of things like toothbrush, even DVDs, cell phones, that kind of things relative to food is lower in India. So one of the reasons why uh, people seem to be spending, uh, one possible reason, I'm not saying this is a theorem, but this is a conjecture, let's say, is one of the reasons why people in India spend much, more on, much less on food and more on other things compared to people in Papua New Guinea is that there is nothing to get in Papua New Guinea except food. Uh, so <laughs> if you're poor, like there is like, what can you buy? Well, in India, you can buy shampoo of this kind, and everything's produced locally, hence the relative prices are, are lower. So, uh, so that's, that's a possible explanation for this pattern, yeah. Is this just the different prices across countries for food? I thought that the $1 a day standard was in terms of purchasing power. So wouldn't that make For your entire budget? budget? So it's, uh, the $1 a day standard take, takes a, a basket of consumption goods. Of course, food is an important part of it, but there is also the other things that people consume. So it takes the, it takes the, the $1 a day, uh, takes the, the basket of goods. In fact, it, the way it's computed here, it's the 16 rupees a day, actually, takes the basket of goods that is consumed by the poor. Uh, rather than any uh, than your basket of good or my basket of good, and price it in the different places and adjust with that. So food plays an important part, but other things play as well. And then within a same dollar a day, it could be that, say in India, for example, food is relatively uh, expensive relative to other things, just because the other things are so cheap and available. Yes, if. So it could be. It's a very interesting point, and we are going to make this point. We are going to see this point coming up uh, in another guide very soon. Uh, the point is that uh, we don't really know what's the requirement, what's the cal calorie requirement for a human being, partly because it depends on the climate and it depends on what you are doing. And it depends on how much calories you're losing to illnesses and other things like that. Uh, one way to, one piece of evidence that suggests it's not the entire story is that if it were the case, if I look at the size, if I looked at the size of the Indian people compared to the size of anyone else, what should I see? Sorry? Well, in your hypothesis, where the difference is due to the fact that they need less calories because it's warm, if, ex if everything was explained here by the fact that Indian people don't need that much calorie compared to, see, all these countries are warm, uh, but compared to say, South Africa, South Africa is a bit more temperate. So in people, poor people in South Africa need to eat a lot because uh, it's cold uh, when it's the winter there. Then if all the differences in calorie consumption were, ex were to be explained by these needs, we would find people whose nutritional status would be comparable. So their height would be the same and their weight would be the same. And in fact, uh, Indian people are very, very short and they are very, very skinny. Now you might say, yes, but that's uh, genetic, right? It's just like Indian people are short. Uh, <laughs> but that's actually not true because the children, when people, when, when Indian migrants come to the US, they start eating U.S. food, their children are still smaller. But the children of their children, some of you might be that, are exactly as tall as anybody else. So it suggests that the genetic potential of Indian people in terms of height and body size is no different than that of anybody else. But it's the nutrition, it's their, it's their nutritional status that is different. And that affects them directly, and that affects their children just because uh, of when you're, in ut when, when you're in utero in someone who doesn't eat enough, you'll also be smaller. For the longest time, people saw Japanese people were short, uh, but it turns out that the, the height in Japan are converging to the height everybody else in the world. So this is more of a nutrition thing than, uh, than all this cereal and meat that we're consuming, than, uh, than uh, a genetic potential problem. So 
going back to sort of the so two punchlines here. One is that this is moving a lot, which suggests that there is a, say, some margin of choices, at least in India, for example. <laughs> Second is we have this alcohol and tobacco that we could, in principle, get rid of. And then all of that would be extra calories. So that suggests that this is high, this is important, but there seems to be some amount of wiggle room to, to take uh, Ben's word. There is some amount of wiggle room here. And to look at other form of wiggle room, uh, so another way to, to, to look at it is to look at um, this question, which is what is the elasticity of food consumption with respect of calorie consumption with respect to your uh, income? So this log per capita outlay is some fancy way of saying log per capita expenditure, which is a good measure of your wealth. And what you can see is that this is a log per capita ca calorie. This is looking at Maharashtra in 1983. India has grown a lot since 1993, but Maharashtra in 1993 were, was a pretty poor place. And what you find is that as people become richer, they do consume more. The slope of this line is about 0.3. And the slope of this line, when I run a regression of log per capita on calorie and log per capita outlay, what is the slope giving me? The elasticity. So when I run a log log regression, I get the elasticity. Interestingly, this is not a regression. I mean, this is a regression, but not a linear regression. This is a non-parametric regression, which means that if the shape had been what I told you it could be, which is very high elasticity early on, and then a lower one, so something we would expect if, the, if we were in the S-shaped world of the elasticity being above one for the poor and then less. This, the way they have estimated this regression allows for this to be the case. But that's not what they find. They find an elasticity of point, about 0.35, pretty much constant across the range in the data. Now, no one here is very rich, so it's quite possible that it starts going down here. But the point is that even for the very poorest, that elasticity is not above one. So even the very poorest have an angle curve phenomenon, which is they only consume as they become richer. They don't start eating as much as possible, eating the extra calories up. They're eating, they're eating uh, in terms of calories. If I increase your income by 10%, you increase your calorie consumption by 30%. So these two first things suggest that maybe this is somewhat unlikely that there would be this very strong uh, that there would be this very strong S shape because otherwise people would be behave, behaving in a very bizarre way. So we've seen that. Um, so I think we've covered we've covered this. So the, the calories increase with overall consumption. Increase with overall consumption, but not one for one. When total expenditure increased by 10%, the consumption of calories increased by 3.5%. So we have an angle curve that is true for uh, everyone. So why is the slope of the angle curve less than one? So what happens is uh, what um, was suggested earlier, which is when people get a bit more money, they do increase the share of the, the they do increase the share of the budget going to other things. So the elasticity of overall food expenditure is less than one. That's about 0.7. So if, you increase, if I increase your budget by 10%, you increase your food consumption by 7%, and then it means you increase something else more than proportionally. So maybe you start spending, spending movie, money on the movies, which you were not doing before. So that's the first thing. So 7% is, uh, is not uh, three, though. So what is the difference between seven and three? So when I increase your budget by 10%, uh, you increase your food budget by 7%, but your calories only increase by 3.5. 3 so what happened in the meantime? Steve? They bought maybe yummier food, which wasn't as high in calories. They bought more expensive food anyway. <coughs> maybe because that food was yummier, maybe because it was more nutritious, but certainly more expensive food. So what is that? When you spend more on food, you start buying more expensive calories. And you do that uh, in various ways. You start eating meat instead of eating cereals. And you start eating more expensive cereals instead of the coarse cereals you were, the, you were eating before. 
And even within the more expensive cereals, rice, for example, you buy more expensive rice. So all of this margin happens. And we can see it here in the table. We can see this is, this is Maharashtra, 1983. These are the poorest 10% and the top 10%. You can see that the poorest 10% spend 46% of their budget on cereals, and the top 10% 31%. And if we look at meat, uh, meat is 8.5% for the poorest and 12% for the richest. Things that are constant, however, in terms of fraction of the budget, is sugar, and the sugar actually goes down, 7.4 to 5%, and oil. That remains about the same. The fraction of the budget spent on oil is 9% for both. But you get cereal going down, and you get meat going up. And the price per calorie of cereal is much cheaper compa compared to the price of, uh, per calorie of, of meat. And now within cereal, people who are poor spend 9% of their budget on uh, rice, and the richer are spending almost 11% of their budget on rice. And then within and then the price of rice is also ch cheaper than the, price of, uh, uh, than the price of other things like, uh, rice is more expensive, sorry, than other things like the coarse cereal. And even within rice, the poor are buying cheaper rice than the rich. So the poor are spending 89 pesos per calorie for the rice and uh, one, per, one rupee per calorie for the richer people. So all of this margin happen, which again suggests that there is some amount of flexibility, because otherwise what you, what you would do is to, within the same budget, uh, continue to eat the same thing, but more of the same thing. So if you were at subsistence level, you would, uh, the, the, the share of your calorie that comes from the staple food would remain constant. And it's only after you've reached some level of subsistence that you would say, now I can start eating more meat. It's more expensive, but it's yummier. And so the fact that even for these relatively poor people, we see that the share of consumption that comes from, the share of calories that comes from rice declines uh, is an in indication that they uh, probably see themselves as having some margin of choice. So even among the very poor people, an increase in economic well-being has positive, but not a huge uh, impact on calorie consumed. So you take the poorest person here, and you increase their budget by 10%, they will increase their calories by 3.5%. Partly because there are other things they like to do, partly because with eating food, they, they, they also like to eat better food. So that brings us to this uh, Jensen Miller uh, idea, which is this idea of a uh, given good. So what's a given good? Good that um, when the price increases, there's an increase in demand for the good. And in, when the price increases, there is an increase in demand. And why is that? That's that's good, right? Why is that surprising? Because generally, when demand curves, you've got well, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, generally, the demand curve as uh, as as the price increases, there's a decrease in the demand for the quantity. Generally, we think of the demand curve as sloping down. So if there is an increase in the price, you decrease the uh, your demand. So why, uh, why can there be? Why is it not a violation of everything we know about economics? Uh, because if the price of some good increases, then uh, you wouldn't be able to like, substitute out to another good easily. So the example of rice and meat, right? If the price of rice increases, uh, then in order to get the calories you need, you might have to buy more rice and just stop buying meat. Right. So the story that uh, Mr. Giffen was referred so Mr. Giffen is referred to by who for the first time? As someone, uh, are there some writing by Mr. Giffen? Indiana Jones. Uh, so Indiana Jones, but before that, uh, so Mr. Giffen, we have no writing from him directly, but he was referred to by uh, Adam Smith. And Adam Smith gives the example of potato in, uh, potatoes in, in Ireland. The price of potatoes goes up. But potatoes is such an important part of the budget that when the price of potatoes goes up, it has an income effect. So that is always true. When the price of a good goes up, it has an income effect. 
and it has a substitution effect. What do we know about the sub substitution effect? Yeah. Well, generally, if you, if the price of one good goes up, if you're less, then you substitute for another. Right. So, so this, the, the, when the price of a good goes up, uh, you substitute toward other goods. So the substitution effect is always negative. But what the income effect can be either positive or negative. So the income effect can be, in what case is it positive? So for example, uh, if you look at iPod consumption, would that, be, would that tend to have a in positive income effect or a negative income effect? So the goods that are more like luxury goods that are a bit expensive will have positive income effect, meaning as you become richer, you will consume more of them. The goods that are cheaper and that are not particularly desirable will have negative income effect. For example, uh, you think about your own budget. As you become richer, maybe you're going to buy more orange juice. That has a positive income effect. Maybe you're going to uh, get uh, fewer macaroni and cheese pre-packed. Uh, that has a negative income effect. So the income effect could be positive or could be negative. It's positive if it's a normal good. It's negative if it's an inferior good. So now something like potato is presumably an inferior good. That's not something people love. It's something that as they become richer, they will try and substitute to our nicer things. So the question is whether the income effect of an inferior good like, uh, like potato is so large, not only it's negative, but it is so large that it outdoes the, positive su the, the substitution effect. So if the income effect is so large that it more than compensates for the substitution effect, then you might be getting a given good. So that is the story of the potato famine, which, was, uh, which is possibly apocryphal. The story being the, the price of potato increases, but that makes people poorer. So that actually increases their consumption of potatoes because they stop eating meat and they eat only potatoes because they have no money left to buy any meat. So this is a given good. So until this paper, I think there was a strong suspicion among economists that uh, Different good actually didn't exist, that they were a nice theoretical probability, possibility, but that in practice you don't see a good where the income effect is so large that it outdoes the substitution effect. So that if you become richer, you eat fewer potatoes, but if the price of potatoes declines, you eat more potatoes. So this is the, uh, this is the story. So, a staple food that constitutes a large part of the budget, like potato for Irish famine, or the example they have in China, or what? Um, these were two provinces uh, in the north, which were mostly wheat and their cereals, and in the south, uh, rice. Or wheat, and, wheat and rice. So these are goods where, which, which are a fairly large part of the food budget and a fairly large part of the overall budget. So this is a good candidate for a given good. It, because the, for the income effect to be large, to have any chance to be large enough, it has to be something that takes a large part of your budget. So that's why I decided on this thing. So the first thing they have they done is they look at these two provinces and they observe that, for example, in the rice consuming region, they observe that in cities where the price of rice is higher, people consume more rice. And first, they are very happy, and they say, oh, we have found our given good. But then they get depressed, and they realize maybe it's not a given good. So why, is it not, why do they conclude that it doesn't give them a given good? Well, it's not clear to me which causes which. Like, is it because that the price is higher and people consume more rice, which would make it a given good? Or is it that people consume more rice, so the price becomes higher? Right. We don't know. We are trying to trace a demand curve. But if we only observe prices and quantity, we might be tracing the supply curve. So we don't know whether we have uh, traced the demand curve or the supply curve. And the supply curve, this would be the normal shape for a supply curve. So this is exactly the same type of problems they are facing that we were facing when we were trying to look at the effect of malaria prices on uh, bed nets, which is if we just look at the variation in the world, there is the effect that we are trying to identify 
And there is the possible of a reverse causality, in this case very clear, which is we also have a supply curve that we are trying to trace. So that's why they decided that's not working. So what did they decide to do? Uh, they subsidized uh, rice and wheat, and they saw how people could take response. Exactly. Yeah. What they decided to do is to run a randomized experiment where they subsidized the price of rice in the rice-consuming region and wheat in the wheat-consuming region at various levels. So I think there are three levels of, uh, of subsidies. So they take a sample of households, they distribute a voucher for the reduced price of rice in uh, Hunan and reduced price of wheat in Gangsu to a random subsample uh, sub for more than a month's uh, supply every month. They made sure that the household wouldn't exchange them. Otherwise, what what would be a problem if they didn't make if households started trading them? <laughs> exactly. In particular, if 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 you you try to reduce the price, but if you give voucher and people start exchanging them, think of food stamp. When people sell their food stamp, when that when they sell their food stamp, they are getting money, right? Which is I mean, it's not bad, but why do we think it's an issue? And why would it be a, an issue, a theoretical issue in their, in their cases? Essentially, the price of the rice or wheat would be changing. It wouldn't be changing. Well, if the, because then they would, so the people would get their voucher, and then they would sell it to someone, so they would get money instead. And then they would, with that money, perhaps buy some rice and wheat and buy some other things as well. So the, the, their experiment where they try to change the price of rice or wheat would end up just changing their income without changing the price. Because the marginal price that they are facing when they have, once they have sold their voucher is the same, except they now have more money. So now all they would identify is the income effect. And of course, the income effect would be negative because that's an inferior good. So they would be finding a given good, but that would not be real one, that would be a fake one, due to the fact that their price experiment would be transformed into an income experiment, right? So it's very important for them to keep the, the price experiment intact. So they try to do that and they try to argue in the paper and in the post that you read on Freakonomics that they've done this properly. And after six months, they came back and then they asked detailed questions about the consumption of rice, wheat, and other things. So what do they find? So I'm going to show you the regression table, which gives us the results directly and explain to you what's in the regression table. So it's a long table, but for now, focus on the first column. So what they regress is the percent increase in rice consumption over the percent subsidy. There are three groups of subsidies. I was looking everywhere in the paper for you to have the three prices and the three and the three uh, reductions so that I could plot them, but they were not there. So this is the overall result, which is saying, so basically the way you read this graph, it's saying that your consumption of rice reduces by 23.5% when the subsidy uh, increases uh, by uh, 100%. Or by, so it's, it's directly a, a percentage over percentage. So your consumption of rice reduces by uh, uh, reduces by about a quarter of the reduction, in percentage over a quarter of the reduction in price. So the important thing here is of course that it's negative. And below the coefficient here you get the standard error. So the coefficient is 0 0.235, uh, the standard error is 0 0.14. If you divide by one the other you get the familiar T statistics. This one is above 1.7, so that means this is significant at 10% level which tells you that this is not entirely due to chance. This negative is not like some fluke. It is something which is indeed uh, significantly different from zero. So that's what they find for Hunan. And then uh, they find the opposite for seafood, where the elasticity of seafood consumption with respect to the price of rice is very positive. So what happened in their experiment this is the, your typical uh, given good behavior, is the price of rice increases. That increases, because rice is such an important part of your budget, it amounts to an increase in your income. 
And because of this increase in your income, you feel that you can now get more of your calories from shrimps and fewer from, from food. So that's for Hunan. And so this is the explanation. And for Gansu, we have a positive elasticity. So it means that wheat doesn't appear to be a given good in Gansu. It appears to be an inferior good. It increases less than one for one, but uh, not, uh, in fact, it's not significantly positive, but it's certainly not negative. And in the, they explain why they find a different result in a different place. Patrick? What prevented them from just discounting the actual price they got to get more money to buy substitute goods? Right, so they tried to stop that, so, but we don't know for sure that that's what they, they we don't know for sure that they, 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 they succeeded. What they were very worried about is the resale of the voucher. And their view then is that once you had resold the voucher, then you wouldn't have resold the, the rice. And what they did after that is they did a survey so the data here doesn't come from, uh, doesn't come from, the, uh, what, from the administrative data of what was sold in the shop. The, the survey comes from what people consumed at the end of the day. So to the extent that people didn't lie to them, this is the actual consumption. Uh, so, that would, that, so it could still be the case that they bought the rice, they sold the rice, they bought the rice with the voucher because they could exchange the voucher, but then they, took the, they went to the tr trouble of selling the rice. And that's why it's, it's just an income effect that we are estimating, which is why it's, which is why it's negative. They, t they try to argue that it didn't happen, but that's, of course, a key concern. So why do they say about wheat that why, why did the wheat didn't show them a different good for the wheat, but they have one for the rice? Because people aren't um, eating the wheat itself. They're eating wheat products like noodles. And exactly. They were saying that they sort of got their own good, that people buy rice, but don't buy big packets of wheat. And so that it was kind of the wrong idea. So this, of course, has implication for nutrition, and in particular for a very frequent policy that we find in the developing world, which is a food prices subsidy for greater nutrition. So for example, uh, in Indonesia, we have the Rakshin program. If you remember Paxolin's stories, he got some free rice from the Rakshin program. In India, uh, um, India just introduced uh, the Right to Food Act and a subsidy scheme for rice in rice consuming regions. So India has a, something called the public distribution system where they distribute food uh, to households at reduced prices, to poor households at reduced prices. Egypt spent uh, something like 3% of its GDP on uh, food subsidies. So food subsidies is a very important part of, uh, of the help to the poor in developing countries. It's also a very important part of our, our meaning, the US aid to the poor countries is in the form of food aid, directly food, which we send to, to poor countries. Why are we spending a lot of the, our aid in terms of food aid? Well, when you want to produce your, uh, a lot of food stuff, so it's easier for us to just take that insurance and Yes, so part of the reason why a lot of our aid is in the form of food aid is that it's also aid for our own farmers. Uh, and it's a way of kind of buying the accident and sending them out. So when the weather has been good in the US and the harvest is very big, uh, a lot of more food aid is being spent all over the world. But with that aside, this is a, a, a policy that many people, many countries have to try to subsidize the price of, uh, of food. But if we have something like the given good, what does it, what may happen when people, uh, w if you make the price of the staple poorer, uh, less high, if you make the price of the staple lower? Yes? Don't they spend their other income on other sorts of stuff, not food products? Yes, you might find that something like this happen, which is instead of eating the rice, the rice of, the price of rice has now gone down, instead of eating more rice, you have less rice and more shrimps, and maybe also more cell phones. So the amount of calories that you are getting, if rice is indeed a given good, the increase in the calories you are getting from a decline in the price of rice might actually not be very high. So in fact, it might even be negative, because if the income effect is sufficiently 
large, it might out the, outdo again the price effect. And we might find that as we make food cheaper, people eat less instead of eating more. And that's exactly what they find in Yunnan, where uh, rice was a given good. They find that the, as you decrease the price of rice, uh, people eat uh, fewer calories, not more. So this would be the very standard, uh, this would be the very standard pro-poor policy in your average developing countries, to try to subsidize the staple. And the justification of this policy will typically be in, uh, uh, in the form of we need to increase the uh, calorie consumption because people are trapped in poverty trap like our friend Paxolin. But in fact, if you look at this for this urban household in China, you find the opposite, which is subsidizing the price of rice actually lead to fewer calories consumed. And it's not because people uh, gain in terms of other micronutrients, though we don't have all the other micronutrients, but we get uh, fewer proteins being consumed as well. So this is what they find in Yunnan, but they don't have it in Gansu. So it doesn't, it's not to say that it happens necessarily everywhere, but it is something that might happen. So it is not at all a given that a reduction in the price of food will lead to an increase in, in nutrition. On the bright side, it also means that it's not necessarily a given that the current increase in the food prices that we are observing will lead to people eating fewer calories. Because it might, in, it might have this perverse effect of making them poor and therefore uh, leading them to eat more of calories. So what? a lot on food habits because for example if you eat shrimps, shrimps may not be very calorie rich. But in India, in India people eat a lot of lentils and the next thing that they eat to rice is dal, which is actually very protein, full of protein. So eating less rice and if they spend more on protein, lentils, that's My actually good. Right. So this is of course completely dependent on what you would, uh, what you substitute with. If you substitute rice with lentils, actually it might be more nutrition, have more iron, more nutrition, etc. So we might find an increase in nutrition due to subsidizing the price of rice. So the only point here was not to say that it has to be the case, was to say that it doesn't have to be the case that subsidizing the price of rice will lead to more rice and more calories being consumed. Now let's look at India precisely. So before that, it is something that should, be, should surprise you in the, when you put together this Jensen Miller result and what we had before in India, we found that the richer households eat about, when a household that are 10% richer, eat about 3.5 more calories. But the Jensen Miller result, what does it suggest about the income effect? If we, fi we are finding that when the price of rice decreases, you eat less, not more. What the income effect has to be? It has to be negative. So on the one hand, I showed you positive income effect, maybe not very large, but certainly positive for India. On the other hand, I'm showing you price effect in China, which suggests that the uh, income effect have to be negative, and in fact, very negative. So how, how can this be? How can we have the two things together? So the first thing is that in India, we were comparing different households. We were not comparing the same household to which I give you each, to which I give more money. So, and different households are different. Maybe the households that are a bit richer, they're also more educated and they understand the value of nutrition and that's why they eat more. So the ideal experiment would be to give people a little bit more money, really literally do that, and see whether they spend this money on food or not. And that would allow us to estimate the income effect. To my knowledge, no one has done that. It's a little bit difficult to parachute uh, uh, helicopter drops of money on people. Not impossible, but it's not been done, I don't think. So what we have when we looked at the India curve, we find that people who have more money uh, eat more, but it may be because they have different tastes, or it might be because they eat more, and therefore they're more productive, therefore they have more money. So the opposite relationship. So that may be an overestimate, that positive estimate, which was already not that high, of the income effect might have been an overestimate. 
And one thing that suggests it is that, and it goes back to Swati's point earlier, is when we plot the angle curve over time in India, uh, we see something imp interesting, which is that we see two interesting things. Number one, all of the angle curve for the rural areas are above the angle curve for the urban areas. What do you think that would be the case? So, see? The work in the rural areas is like much more labor intensive, so we need to eat more to have physical strength. Exactly. The work in rural areas is more intensive, and so they need more calories. So this is interesting that you are making this point, because this is the point you were making earlier about maybe the needs uh, for calories in South Africa is are bigger because it's colder. So that's the first things we notice. So this we can explain. And what's the other interesting trend in this picture is that over time, the angle curves are falling down. People are eating uh, less and less and less for the same level of income. So what happened in India over time is that, of course, people got richer. So if the angle curves had been stable, they would have eaten more. But because the angle curves are also falling down at the same time, they are eating. What happened with, over time is that people are moving first across to another angle curve and then up along an angle curve. So take someone who would be at a log income of 5. 15 years later, they have a log income maybe of 5.5. But the angle curve have also moved. So now instead of, sorry. Yeah, so now instead of uh, eating, so take someone, who, sorry, take someone who is at five, and then 15 years later, they would be, let's say, at six. But now we need to find the six on a much lower angle curve. So instead of eating more, as they would have if the angle curve had become stable, we find that people in India eat less and less. So over time, the poor in India are eating less and less instead of eating more and more which does suggest the same negative income elasticity for the country as a whole. The country is becoming richer, and those people are becoming richer, but they are eating less and less. So this, is, this now starts to make sense with the two results where maybe the income elasticity of, of food consumption, not only it's not above one, which is what we would have in a poverty trap kind of a world, but it might be negative, which is as people become richer, they, if anything, eat fewer calories. So if we look at nutrition in India, we have a pretty interesting phenomenon, which is this is the share of people who are eating below 2,100 in urban areas and 2,400 in rural areas. So why are these? This is the number of calories they consume per head. Uh, why, is this, um, why are these interesting thresholds? Yeah. OK. You had a question or you were just moving? Yeah, I was going to ask something. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, I was wondering if that necessarily, uh, if that couldn't just be explained because of like inflation and not necessarily like a negative economic factor. Very good. It could, be, it could be that the relative price of, of food has changed, right? That people have, people have become richer, but food is now more expensive. Right. Remember, it has to be relative prices, right? Because people have become richer in real term. We, all, we, we always do, it's even corrected for inflation, India is richer now, and there are also fewer poor people. But it could be that food prices increase relative to other things. And that's actually not the case until 2005. And then it became very much the case after 2005. But these results are until 2005, where the relative price of food were relatively stable. That's a very good point. Uh, 2100, 2400? Yeah. Right, so this is what, again, we don't really know how many calories we need, but this is what the Indian government says you need. And maybe they get it a bit wrong because this is the fraction of people in rural area who are getting less than they need. So it's very high, yet you know, these people are still all alive. And it's also, but what is striking is that this is increasing, both in rural area and in urban area, but even more in rural area. So one first explanation was yours is maybe it's the price of it's the relative price of food. That would be true after 2005, but not until 2005. What could be other explanation? Maybe a lot of poor people have gone from the rural areas to the city, and 
very far for me, rural areas and then the sort of rural areas and both sort of. All right, so that's a very good suggestion. So it may be that the, the, the people who are in rural area now are the very, very poor, so they are relatively poorer. So we get more of them who are eating, eating less. And the urban area also getting poorer because the people from the rural area move to them. That's a very good suggestion, a composition, by, a composition effect. Uh, that probably doesn't explain it because if you look at the uh, cons overall consumption per capita of these people or the fraction of people who live below a dollar a day, that is going down here and down here. So that's probably not the... Uh, There's been more technology for them to spend other money, money on other stuff than just food. Right, so this, is, this would be another explanation, which is the similar explanation from what we are seeing around the world, which is there are more and more things available. In particular, one thing that has clearly happened is the, the advent of cell phone. Uh, and so now cell phones weren't there, now they are there. In India, you can get a cell phone and airtime everywhere. And so that's one thing. Uh, that, so more things become available. Very good. Yeah. Uh, I think this might be what you meant, but uh, technology that might make the work easier, so you require fewer calories because the work is not as difficult. Right. This is not what she meant just now, but that's what she meant earlier. So I was surprised she is not making this point again. But that's exactly a very good point, which is maybe the these are you know what the Indian government says, but who knows what they what they know, and maybe the calorie requirements have changed. One of the reasons could be that you're less likely to do backbreaking work, or maybe because there is more irrigation, there is more mechanization of agriculture. People are less likely to be in agriculture, even in rural areas. What would be another reason why the calorie requirement would have gone down? So one is clearly you are less likely to work. What's another? What competes to calories with calories with you? Warmth and health, so, and diarrhea, and other nice things like that. Generally, being sick consumes a lot of calories. Uh, and so if people, one thing that has happened in India is drinking water has become more available and cleaner, so people are much less likely to be sick. Another thing that uses a lot of calories is being pregnant, and you have fewer uh, children being born, many more fewer children being born, so that's also compete less for calories. So one possible reason for all of this, for these changes, is that uh, the calories requirement, the calorie requirements have just changed, and people are staying at the same, staying at the same level as before takes them less, and they're used to a particular level, so they just stay there, and it costs less, them less money than before. Uh, so why are people? So this leads us to a possibility for what people are not eating, more generally. Maybe they're not eating because that's not such a great investment. Uh, and so we, when we went through our little theory section here, we said that if you happen to be right here in the capacity curve, it's very valuable for you to eat. But if in the real world, the effect of calories on productivity is not that large, then you, know, you, might, well, you might as well do something else with your money. And in fact, what we find when we look at the effect is that this is the effect of calories consumed on your productivity if you're a farmer in Sierra Leone. And it's hard to find a job that requires less strength than being a farmer in Sierra Leone. And what you find is what? Well, it is increasing, certainly. People who eat more, this is your calorie consumption, on, and this is how, effect, how productive you are. People are more productive when they eat more. But what's the shape of the curve? Is it our, it's our inverted L shape. And it's not greater than 1. So now we finally can answer the question that you asked ages ago. There is no really sign. And this is probably the most favorable case, which is why I put it on the, on the board. There's no real sign that this phenomenon that you need to, in, to eat enough calories, otherwise you can't be productive enough to do anything, is really there. So in the very short run, everything starts to fit, which is people don't really need the extra calories that much, because the extra calories makes them productive, but not that much more productive. Hence, they're not eating them. And in fact, we see over time that they're eating less and less of the calories, because they need less and less of them. And they have a level of strength that allows them to do their day-to-day -day work, 
and with the rest of the money they do other things and that makes now perfect sense. So in terms of policies, what does it mean? In terms of policies, it means that policies that are going to insist that the big problem is starvation in terms of not eating enough grain are probably going to be misleading and are probably going to lead to a fair amount of, and they are probably going to lead to a fair amount of waste. Nevertheless, you probably shouldn't go away thinking, so in summary, at the maximum, when your income today increased by 10%, your calorie consumption increased by 3.5%. That's what we saw in India. And that's almost surely a wild overestimate. But let's say that it's a maximum possible. And then your productivity increased by another, uh, you multiply that by another 4%. So when you inc your income increased by 10%, your income increased by 1.4% tomorrow. That would be the S shape, except it's not S, because there is no point where it would cross the 45 degree line from below because the elasticity is much, much less than one instead of being above one. So we don't have a place where the curve is crossing the 45 degree line from below. The curve is just not steep enough to, have, uh, to create a poverty trap from this phenomenon. Just to be sure that uh, you don't go away thinking everything is well, this may be very different for other things than calories, for example, iron. And this may be very different for children because the investment in a child, the investment you're making at one specific time is going to help them for their entire life instead of just for tomorrow. So what we are going to do on Thursday is look at what I call the hidden trap, which is that there might be a nutrition productivity poverty trap, but it's not in the usual sense where we were looking for. It's in these more subtle things, nutri nutrients, micronutrients, Children's nutrition, pregnant women's nutrition.